Hi, everyone, and welcome to the European VC Podcast. I am David, and I'm joined by Andreas, as usual. Today, we are welcoming Fadi. Fadi is a founding GP at Cybernetics Ventures, a $15 million pre-seed seed and Series A venture fund in Boston to back North American and European companies within manufacturing, logistics, construction, and healthcare. Cybernetics are investing out of Fund One with, as I said, a total of 15 million USD in AUM and an established portfolio of 13 companies and notable investments, including Realtime Robotics, Airworks, Bionimus, Bionimus, and Kiwaz. And just before we get started, let me just give you a bit of a preamble. As I've just spent a full day with Fady and a group of robotics investors and founders at an exclusive investor event here in my beloved homeland, Denmark. It's actually my old hood because it was in Odense. So I'm super happy to be back for a day of discussing the state of venture within robotics and just talking to founders and and, and DCs about how to navigate the current market shifts and much, much more. It's been some really honest, thoughtful conversations that I'm always very honored to be part of and very happy to be able to facilitate. So thanks a million for the invite to the team at Odense. And I cannot wait to see all of you there if you're robotics investors, because I do really think that this is one of the places to be. And you'll also hear that in the episode you're about to listen to. If you're listening in and love our show, do drop us a review, follow the pod, and subscribe at eu.vc. This was their final tower. Tear down this wall. It's more than just an alliance. An alliance. This, this is a union of values, of values. United and determined, we can serve as a model for other regions of the world. The, world. the nature of a problem, problem requires a European response. Europe is a story of new beginnings, new, new beginnings. Let's start acting, 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 acting. This show is not investment advice, and the hosts of this episode may be invested in the funds and companies featured. So, Fadi, let's start this thing off as we always do by asking you to share with us your story of getting into venture. Thank you for having me. My story is uh, I, I never thought of being an investor in the first place, so... I'm a mechanical engineer by training, spent the first bulk of my career working for large corporate, Siemens, Nokia, came to MIT after eight years in the industry, did a mid-career master's around kind of complex systems and venture building, and uh, found myself in robotics and co-founding Mass Robotics, which became the largest hub for robotics companies in the U.S., got kind of connected with hundreds of robotics companies, investors, corporates. And um, one day I was hosting a a VC from the many VCs I uh, was kind of interacting with and introducing companies to. And he said, uh, wow, what a unique kind of position you have in the ecosystem. You should seriously consider becoming a VC. And this was the seed he planted in my mind. And this seed started to grow and... uh, before I realized, I found myself kind of designing uh, a unique fund that's focusing on robotics companies. And uh, I said, if I'm going to do this, it needs to be unique. It needs to be kind of fulfilling a need and a gap in the space. And uh, this was the, uh, the, the birth of uh, Cybernetics Ventures. And um, here we are. Fadi, we will, we will obviously go deeper in terms of robotics and what that's about. So everyone listening in that's interested about that, stay tuned. For now, uh, I love to ask this question to all our guests, which is tell us a pivotal moment in your life. And more importantly, how did it shape you as an investor today? I think um, a pivotal moment is uh, when um, the night I, I received the acceptance letter uh, for MIT. Uh, I I will never forget this night. And uh, the reason is, it was not an easy ride for me. It was probably a five-year journey of kind of putting my application, setting on target schools and reference and applying, taking the GMAT, not getting a good score, taking it again. And it's just such a pain in the neck to kind of go back and study these kind of standard tests. And I'm, I'm originally from Egypt, so uh, English is not my first language. And the English section in the test is just horrible. <laughs> so um, I, I, I was already at a disadvantage. The, the reason that this is a pivotal moment because in a second, all those five years kind of flashed in front of me. And the lesson was, it paid off. And once you go through an experience like that, 
it break a psychological barrier that you just focus on the work. You do the work. You do the hard work. You learn. You evolve. And then good things will happen. And this became a second nature to me. It happened at MIT. It happened in robotics. It happened in mass robotics. It happened for raising cybernetic, raising a fund, as you can imagine, especially a first fund. I'm not coming from the VC space. I'm an outsider. I was never a VC. I advised VCs, but I, I'm not a VC. I'm, I'm an outsider. And people like were telling me, forget it. This is a mission impossible. You cannot raise a a fund one with no kind of track record, with no kind of VC experience, but it pays off. Amazing. We'll dive much more into why it was possible and why your thesis around robotics is something that attracted LPs. But we'll get to that. Now let's head into the take a stand section. Take a stand. Fadi, for this, I will ask you to comment on a quote by Chris Smith from Playfair Capital, and that is, Gen AI is not going to have the impact on startups that people want and expect. My answer is yes and no. The yes is, uh, as we have seen with lots of other technologies, with drones, with autonomous vehicles, with all, all sorts of technology, I mean, AV, um, AR and VR, like... It is a well-studied kind of technology cycle. So when there's a new technology, everyone gets excited. People have high expectations, sometimes unrealistic expectations because of lack of deep understanding of what's the technology, how does it work, what are the limitations. But then this hype eventually goes down and people start to realize, oh, it's not really that. All of this kind of gold rush is not really true. And then people start to having more realistic uh, expectation of what the technology can do. A very good example is autonomous vehicles. Everyone thought like five years ago, like now we will be all riding autonomous vehicles and it didn't happen. Why? Because of lots of things. It's not an easy thing. There is regulation. There is the public kind of uh, reception for the idea. Uh, there is lots of issues. So I think now we are living this whole kind of cycle with generative AI. There is unrealistic expectations from Gen AI because most people, they don't understand how it, it really works. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a massive kind of word forecast kind of um, uh, platform, especially the language one, the LNMs. And not many people understand that. They think it's some sort of a magical thing that understand and reason and all that. And there is no reasoning. It just predicts what's the next word. This is what it does. So I think eventually this hype will go down and people will have more realistic uh, understanding. Yet, I think that generative AI will disrupt and change many things. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very um, disruptive technology. It's a... It's a very pivotal technology, and uh, I think we we just crossed an inflection point, and uh, I think we are looking at an impact similar to the PC kind of impact, similar to the internet impact. We're looking at something that kind of massive. So, Fadi, um, you know we've heard, and our listeners have heard that you're knee deep in robotics. And, you know, I'm an engineer myself. I, I studied engineer. My, my, my desk colleagues at uni were, were your peers in terms of were mechanical engineers. So whenever I walk in a room and I see, I don't know, a robot doing fine motor skills or a freaking robot jumping and doing a backflip, I'm like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the geeky nerd in me speaking. I've yeah. never really dived deep into robotics from an investment standpoint. Yeah. And so I'm very much looking forward to learn from this conversation. I'd love to have you kind of, Start off by expanding, okay, why do you think robotics is interesting as an investment vertical? What is sure. actually the opportunity here? What, what kind of engineer are you? A mechanical engineer? I'm an, I'm an industrial engineer, so I'm a fake engineer, oh. as they call it, right? Because I did half of, my, half of my degree was similar to yours, I would say, to some extent, and then the other half was much more like management, innovation, et cetera. Sure, et cetera. sure, sure. No, I love industrial engineering. I think it's, uh, it's very important and it gives rise to all the manufacturing kind of advances. Yeah, exactly. There. And so it's, um, it's important. So, so robotics, 
we like to think of robotics in terms of verticals. Uh, I think think of robotics in the void is is no longer kind of a good strategy. And robotics is not an industry. Robotics is a technology. So we need all to agree on that. When I say robotics, in my mind, uh, I mean smart machines. I mean some sort of actuation that has some sort of intelligence. Sometimes when we say robotics, people imagine humanoids, which is a subset of robotics, but it's not. This does not equal robotics. Uh, and we can speak about humanoids uh, a little bit later. But um, uh, this is what, what, what we think of robotics, smart machines. Just to drive home your point, right? Because the attentive listener will have heard in the beginning that we said that the cybernetics ventures invests in manufacturing, logistics, construction, and healthcare. We didn't say robotics. Um, but if you go to your website, you'll see that it says robotics everywhere. Um, and, and you're also introduced to me as as a robotics investor. So I think this pinpoints exactly, and, and you also very much self-identify as a robotics investor. But the point is, it's in the applications. It's where the, the ro robots actually make a huge difference. Yes, yes. So it's a uh, use case is everything. And uh, we, we look at smart machines in those four key verticals. And you can apply robotics in any vertical, but through our experience in the space, the data we have looked at, the large kind of um, number of corporates that we dealt with, we formulated this thesis that those are the four key verticals that we will have the highest adoption rate of robotics and consequently the highest ROI in terms of any activities in the space. So we, we decided to focus on manufacturing because obviously this is traditionally speaking, manufacturing logistics, highly automated spaces. Uh, but now we are moving kind of beyond just pure automation, which doesn't have much intelligence and less adaptability into more of a, uh, a smart automation, which is robotics. And these are machines that can adapt uh, are flexible, doesn't have to do the same thing every every time. Uh, you don't need to tell them exactly what they need to do. They they can understand the higher level kind of task and they decide how to get there. So these are some of the activities happening. We see collaborative robots, we see autonomous mobile robots as a kind of a second generation to uh, AGVs, the autonomous guided vehicles. So AMRs now is more of like, it's uh, autonomous, it can navigate on itself. You don't need to tell it exactly which route to take. Uh, it doesn't need to follow lines or beacons or uh, these kind of things. It can see humans, obstacles, and identify them. Construction also, we're seeing lots of activities happening because this is an industry that suffering from labor shortage and increased uh, pressures on productivity and higher demands. We don't have enough housing in the US, for example. And, and we don't have enough labor to do it. So how would you do that? Uh, you have to introduce and embrace smart machines. So that's why we invested in companies like Airworks, automating the surveying process and CAD drawings from aerial pictures. Uh, that's why we invest in rugged robotics, um, printing, layout for construction places. Coazo out of Germany, a lift bot for scaffolding kind of movement between different floors. Uh, raised robotics in San Francisco, the facade brackets installation kind of um, activities. So um, these are some of the examples in the construction space. And in healthcare, we have a large understanding. It's um, it's pharmacy, uh, pharma automation, uh, biomanufacturing, uh, surgical robots, uh, prosthetics, uh, lab automation. So there is there's lots of activities. And again, it's a uh, we have seen from the pandemic the need to kind of sustain our healthcare systems uh, with minimal kind of humans around and also how you can speed up um, drug development, vaccine development. So automation and AI and, and robotics played a big role in that. And, and we, um, we want to continue to invest in that. We invest in a company out of Switzerland called Bionymous. And they basically automated the sortation and inspection of biological, small biological entities. So those are the kind of verticals that we focus on. We, we are skeptical of consumer robotics. We are skeptical of humanoids. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of taking the opportunity to warn my fellow investors there 
Uh, I know it's cool, it's attractive, but it's very tough to make it to work. Uh, the business case is not yet there. I, I don't believe that we are yet there. So uh, I, I hate to funny. see people losing their money in humanoids. It's funny you say it because because I was listening to this week in startups as a preparation for this where we had we had uh, uh, Jordi Rose, the Sanctuary AI CEO on. And he said, of course, they're doing humanoid robots, so he, he'll have a view on that. <laughs> That's probably different from yours. But he thought that in the next five years, we will have the capability in robotics to be able to actually automate any task or have robotics do any task on the manufacturing floor. Whether the business case makes sense, whether the, there would be a business model to actually do that, blah, blah, blah. That's, of course, a different thing, right? But the technological ability to automate or have a robot do anything that's done in a factory floor today, do you think that we will have that in five years? Is that is that where we are on the, uh, on the technological front? And, and when you say a robot, you mean a humanoid? Uh, whatever, right? So it can be done by something that will be doing it without being controlled by a human, and it'll be able to deduce it probably on the back of AI, right? Uh, and, and figure out how to do the task on the back of your request. It's a very bold and ambition, uh, ambitious uh, statement because, for example, in the uh, closing industry, manufacturing closing, one of the toughest kind of problems in, in robotics now, how do, you, how do you manipulate closing? How do you move fabric? How you can... It's very tough. We, we, we don't yet have the technology for that. So this is just one example. And when you look at the, the trajectory curve, you don't see us being able to do that in five years. We cannot say that we can solve all the problems and we can automate anything uh, in, in, in manufacturing within five years. I think this is uh, uh, pretty bold. But, uh, and, and, and guess what? I don't think that we need to automate everything. The ultimate end in mind uh, is, is also questionable. Uh, do we really need to automate everything? Because there is diminishing returns. Like, to be fair, he did not say that, right? He just said that the technological capability would be there. The question is then, will we want to, with the business model, be there? And all that, that's, of course, a different question. I hope so. I hope so. And uh, if he means humanoids, I don't think that humanoids will be widely adopted and used in five years. Uh, there, is a, there is a psychological challenge. There is a regulation challenge. There is unions challenge. Because once you have a machine, that looks like a person, uh, it becomes the enemy, you know? And unions will kind of fight this back and there will be a lot of clash. And at one point, Bill Gates was su suggesting um, having robotics taxes and like, because it becomes a person, you know? I think there will be lots of issues. And there is a, there is another argument that I've heard and I'm, I'm, I'm also a little bit kind of skeptical about it that we need humanoids because all of our environment is built around humans, so we need humanoids to do the work. And I think that this is a flawed argument because this is not true. We build machines to do the tasks and jobs that we cannot do or we don't want to do. No, but it is a big philosophical uh, discussion and we could definitely dive into it. I think, I think it's more, the only thing about, about that is it's very, more interesting to be bringing in multiple angles. So for that conversation, we should have multiple stakeholders around the table. So let's let's wait with that for another time. But I'd love to zone more into how you, as a robotics investor, and now I'm saying robotics instead of manufacturing, logistics, construction, and healthcare investor, how do you put together your thesis within these these segments? Are there are there any places within manufacturing that you're seeing are stronger than others? And, and how do you think about it? Does, does a startup that builds in this space have to maneuver in the same way as, as others? Or are there specificities around robotics that's different and, and for that reason might warrant having a uh, specialist robotics investor on board? It, it's um, There's a very fine balance between being specialized and focused and also being too narrow and not well diversified. So we try to strike this balance in the, the design of cybernetics as a unique fund 
focusing on robotics, automation, and industrial AI is how we can be focused, specialized, but at the same time, we have enough diversification in our investment portfolio. So we try to scope it down in terms of the technologies we invest in, in terms of the verticals that we invest in. But we didn't kind of specify it more than that because we wanted to see what are the innovation out there, what are the corporates kind of bringing in as challenges. And we have a pretty strong network in the corporate space. So this gives us lots of insights about what, what are the market signals in terms of um, needed technologies. So, um, so this is basically the, the kind of focus that we have. And, and we, uh, because we are early stage, the, like once we pass the kind of basic things in terms of the technology and market scoping, we immediately focus on the team. So we have pretty detailed thesis around what kind of people we invest in. Over the years, we have seen, I mean, all the amazing companies we, uh, we were very fortunate to have here in Boston and, and in the U.S., uh, starting from Kiva to uh, Locust Robotics, Six River, Emotional, Corendus in the surgical robot space, uh, and, and many others. I'm probably I'm, I'm forgetting some Brooks Automation and obviously Universal Robot from Denmark um, and others. Like we looked at those companies and we studied the founding story and the founding teams on those companies. And, and we, we looked at kind of different data points. And, and, and this kind of formulated our thesis in terms of who are the most successful founding teams in robotics. And it came down to this kind of balance between very strong, very competent and innovative um, technical founder married with uh, a very experienced vertical or industry professional. If you have those two mix, probably you you will navigate your way through the, the whole kind of entrepreneurial journey and build a successful company. If you are missing one of those, it dramatically kind of lower your chances of success. You mentioned there a company that I know rather well, I'd say, um, from the outside, which is Universal Robots in Denmark, of course. I'd love to ask you if you know if you've been close enough to that company to be able to 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 relay a bit the story at least from your study and, and use that as a key story because it is one of the great success stories coming out of Odense and, and Denmark in particular. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't claim that I was close to the founding of the company, obviously because of kind of geographical location. I was in Boston, the Fort Square, and yeah. and Odense, but I got a chance to interact with. Uh, Espen, the uh, founder and CTO of the company, uh, uh, Re- uh, uh, Enrico, also the, the CEO of the company. So those are folks I interact with them multiple times. And um, I know investors that invest in the company. I know, obviously, many people at Teradyne because it's a Massachusetts-based company. So I know the corporate development folks and the people who are behind the acquisition. Those are uh, close contacts of mine. So I, I can claim that I know a big kind of part of the story. And um, it's, it's the same story. Uh, a very talented, very competent technical founder, married with very experienced uh, industry uh, person that knows how to quickly build distribution channels and integration network. And uh, they basically kind of overtake the whole, uh, overtook the whole market. It's a, it's a great success story. In, in a very tough space to, to build an arm, considering that you have incumbent dominant players like ABB, KUKA, Fenoka, Kawasaki, Mitsubishi, all those kind of players. So how do you come with a totally disruptive product that take all of them by surprise? And uh, not only that, you become the market leader. Yeah. And what makes, when you think about Look, look at the arm of uh, of uh, of uh, Universal Robots and the team and 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 the technology they ended up developing. What would you say was the thing that unlocked their ability to 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 overtake the all the massive incumbents? Because that's something that's always puzzled me a bit. I, I think it's um, the elegant design of a simple product that meet customer needs. This is this is the statement and. They were not alone when they started kind of working on the collaborative robot space. There were other companies. I mean, some of them uh, were here in Boston. 
but uh, not all companies were as quick as Universal in terms of adapting to the market needs and the market signals. And not all of them had a simple and an elegant design. We come across robotics companies that have a very complex kind of design with multiple points of failure. Like, there is no way that you can make a, a usable product out of that. How many times it will fail? How much maintenance you need to do? How much support you need to do? This is key differences compared to pure software because you need to think about all these kind of things. You are dealing with hardware, things that could fail. People could send those uh, machines back to you. You have to have a reverse logistics process. How would you support and maintain this? What kind of spare parts you need to plan? What kind of training you need to do? So all these kind of things, unless you think about these kind of things, the deployment and the support and the training and, and all of that, the whole life cycle of the product, you will have tough time building a profitable and a viable business out of them. I'll now take us to the shout out segment, Fadi. Fadi, I'd like to ask you to give a shout out to a co-investor, Angel or LP for being awesome. And of course, share with us the story behind that awesomeness as much as you yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to um, my uh, my good friend uh, Oliver Mitchell from FFBC uh, out in New York. I have known Oliver for more than 10 years and he was really one of the very early people in investment in robotics. He was an angel investor. He had his own uh, fund and I would even say that he was like before the the, the, the market in terms of investing in robotics. And uh, I have a huge respect and, and admiration for like what he did in the space. And um, yeah, we, 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 we stayed in touch over the years. We compared notes. And recently he introduced us to one of his portfolio companies uh, out of uh, Germany and the UK. And he said, he told me, Ferry, this is a good company. I sit on the board and you better lead this round. And um, the company, it's not yet uh, disclosed yet, the investment. Uh, it will be um, announced pretty soon. The company was in, um, like not a complete stack. It, it was an enabled technology. And it, um, from the outside, it's a very crowded space. So I was a little bit skeptical. I said, like, Oliver just want to kind of pull me into this deal. But uh, when we look closely at the company, we found a huge differentiation in the technology. Like they, they built a technology that can do something that no one else out there can do. It. So they had a, a super amazing IP and, and differentiation that we immediately knew what are the applications out there for this technology. Yeah, uh, one thing led to, the, to, to another and we kind of syndicated uh, um, uh, around with um, one of our close investors in Germany, uh, a large kind of family office that owns a multi-billion dollar kind of automation company. And uh, we we ended up leading the round and I'm, I'm taking a board seat in the company. And last Friday, actually, we had the first uh, board meeting and Oliver was there. And it was just fun to kind of doing this investment together and being on the same board together. So, uh, and, and none of that would have happened without Oliver kind of like introducing us and really pushing me to have a, a closer look at the company. It's quite fun because um, we in no way are connected via FFVC, but we've actually had um, Oliver's colleague, John Frankel um, from FFVC on the podcast. <laughs> and I think we've had in total 10 US investors out of the 220 episodes we've done so far, 30 or however many it is. So, so that is a fun coincidence. But now I want to take us into how, and I of course have to ask you this question because I'm a Dane. I actually come from Odense uh, originally, almost. At least I got, got my wings um, investing there and, and working in venture there. So it's really my old hood that you're going to when you're getting into a plane in a couple of days to fly out to uh, to Odense for the Odense Robotics Investor Event. So I have to ask you, what makes someone from Boston travel 
And I'm, of course, Boston to the people, and you've said this already. We've got the likes of Kiva, Locus Robotics, Motional, and so on. The list is quite significant for, for, for robotics in Boston. So I'm super curious to hear, why is it that you choose to travel to, to, to little Odense? I think what happened in, in, in Odense over the last uh, probably 10 years, uh, or maybe a little bit less than 10 years, is just phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I think from a totally unknown region to one of the the global kind of hubs for robotics, definitely one of the key hubs in Europe. Universal robot story, mere uh, story, uh, just the activities happening. And I'm a big believer that things that does not happen by itself, there are always people behind things. So we make things happen. Things don't happen just like that. So I think it, it speaks a lot about the, the people in Oinze and their dedication to the region, their commitment, their, um, their pride. And uh, they are the one who, who, who are making Oinze uh, a hub uh, for robotics in Europe. So um, I, I was in Switzerland a few weeks ago, and, and also you look around, it's, it's, it's the people who are making all of these amazing activities in Switzerland. Uh, around robotics and investment, and they had um, the Swiss Robotics Day and all of that. So um, folks like Hust and Martina and Espen and Enrico and Soren and, and all those folks, I mean, phenomenal work, phenomenal work. And, and kind of living through the whole kind of Boston robotics ecosystem and, and, and building mass robotics with the, the rest of the team and the co-founders from the ground up, I know how much effort and how much commitment and how much sacrifices it takes to build something like that. So um, I always wanted to come and um, I uh, I met and, and hosted many people from Oinze in, in Boston. And uh, I was just waiting for the right opportunity. And they were so kind uh, to invite me and, and uh, ask me to um, give a, a far side chat at the event. So uh, I'm, I'm really honored to, uh, to come and, and, and meet a person, uh, all of those kind of heroes of mine, and, and learn more about the, the OIC story. There's so many things that can go wrong in hardware, and, and that's the typical venture take on, on hardware investing. Um, and as you said in the beginning here, what is a robot? Well, it's a smart machine. Okay, smart, that's what venture likes. Machine, less so. Could you just tell us very shortly about whether you're seeing the strength of hops being more important in this sector uh, than in others? And that's why we're seeing something like, like Odense Robotics and Delft in, 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 in Holland and so on originating because of this dynamic around it really needing to be very specialized people and, and, and a strong, close-knit value chain around you for it to be successful? Yeah, I, I get this question a lot. And, and in fact, we, we organized an event last June, first of its kind uh, event in, in the US, probably what it was called Robotics Invest, focusing on investment in robotics and what would it take to build the next generation of robotics unicorns. And uh, the message to, to the investors was, we know that you're not used to investing in, in, in machines. And we know that most investors, either they invest in pure sales, kind of um, software, pure software technologies, uh, or at the far end of the spectrum, biotech. And robotics does not fit in, in, in either of those. It's somewhere in between. But here is the interesting thing about um, robotics and smart machines is we are stepping into an era of software only wouldn't cut it because we simply do not have the manpower to kind of run the economy. We have aging population, uh, improvement in healthcare, making us live longer, but we are not very productive as we age. And we have lots of kind of seniors that we need to take care of, and we ourselves will become seniors sooner or later. Mm -hmm. So we need to have the machines to kind of help us do lots of things. So focusing on machines is not a choice. We have to do that. It's not a luxury. It's a must. It's a, it's a far survival technology for all of us. 
So then the question is, is this the right kind of place to put your money in? And my answer is yes. And the reason is the cost of technology, the cost of hardware has been dramatically going down over the last decade or two in terms of sensors costs, in terms of compute power, in terms of motors, in terms of batteries, all of these kind of things have been dramatically going down due to advances in autonomous uh, electric vehicles and drones and, and other technologies. So this is one thing. The other thing is investing in smart machines is different than investing in consumer products. And the reason is smart machines are sticky. Once you have a piece of hardware deployed on, on a customer side, the chances that they will replace it in a year or two or even five is very low. So then the piece of the hardware becomes a footprint, an enabling tool to generate more revenues out of this. I come from the, I mean, I started my career in telecommunication. As I said, I used to work for Siemens and Nokia. And this was back in the early 2000s. And um, the, the industry, obviously, very mature uh, at that time. But in Siemens, we used to sell the hardware at cost or even at a loss. The profit was not in the hardware. The hardware was enabler to sell more software licenses, more software products, and to sell services, manage services, support, spare parts, all of these kind of things. So I think this is the, the, the perspective that the mindset we should have all as investors. You, you, are, not, you are not investing in, in, in machines. You are investing in a, in a solution that uh, a, a complete system that will solve real problems for the coming 10, 20 years for a customer. So when your company actually deploy a piece of hardware, it's, it's not about the hardware. It's about how much software you can upset out of that, how much services you can build around that. So this is the kind of the way to really make kind of significant returns in, in robotics and have really unicorns and profitable companies in this space. Fidi, I uh, am not a robotics guy at all. So I did enjoy this little bit of learning a bit about robotics, but now it's time for a quick fire round. We'll take you through it. We will ask you three quick answer questions. <laughs> and now the quick fire round. Quick What advice would you give your 10 year younger self? Chill out. <laughs> I cannot disagree with that. <laughs> what are your top tips for emerging VCs across Europe who are fundraising? It's tough. Be prepared for rejection and for skepticism. It's part of the journey. It's a marathon and not a sprint. So you need to prepare for that. Build the right team that will make it easy for folks to bet on you. Uh, in my case, I was very blessed to have an amazing fund partner, Mark Martin, um, super experienced guy, 30 years at analog devices and sensors and bus automation, uh, multi-billion dollar kind of business unit, 700 people across the globe, acquired companies, spun out companies. So having a partner uh, we built uh, a world-class advisory board of who's who in the industry we complemented the seemingly kind of um, weaknesses and gaps in the team in terms of like vc background and all of that so build a team build a the support network around yourself to uh, make people confident that you wouldn't uh, waste their money what's the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you've been in venture being nice and kind pays off. I love that. <laughs> and I could not agree more. And I think that's at least personally for me why I am in venture, because I think that that is exactly the way I want to go through life. And there's nothing better than being in a very integrity driven industry. So, so that kind of forces us all to be as nice as we can be, even in tough circumstances. Everyone listening in, thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us, Fady. If you enjoyed this episode as a listener or as a guest, do make sure to tune in on the EUBC website and let us know what you think. 
Thank you very much, folks. All right. So now just before I let you go and we go to the uh, usual EVC jingle and thus signify that this episode is over, I just want to give you a real quick teaser, a four minute video or so, which also, of course, has audio. So those of you not watching this on YouTube or on EU.BC will also just be able to make sense of it. It's a really cool video showcasing what the ecosystem in, in, in Odin is really like. It is a bit surprising, at least to me, uh, even as a Dane, how big the ecosystem has grown uh, and the uh, the the, the players in within robotics that are that are looking to audience. So hit it up and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Robots are changing our world. They're revolutionizing the way we collaborate, the way we think, the way we work and the way we create. Robots are helping people work smarter and businesses grow stronger. So imagine a place where robotics companies are collaborating instead of competing. Where the ecosystem is capable of commercializing startups and new technologies. Where you will find an international test center for drones. And where the university is so good it won the unofficial world championship in robotics. That place is the Danish city of Wormser. It all started at Wollens' steel shipyard, brought to life by A.P. Müller, the founder of Maersk. Academia and highly educated people were not dominant. It was a production city. To be able to compete with low-cost shipyards, they had to rethink their manufacturing process. So the owner of the shipyard decided to donate some money to the local university to stimulate more robot research. And it was so successful that actual working robots for shipyard welding were produced. Despite their many efforts, the steel shipyard had to close. They were not competitive because of the high wages and the technology at that time was not ready yet. Shipyard was not the only one that was closing at that time. It was, it was really a point where there was a lot of the last companies that was closing. So there was some kind of bad years. It was a major blow for the city. I'm happy to say that there were quite a number of people who were visionary. So uh, there was a new hope. A new team of innovative people had some great ideas. Maybe you've heard of something called universal robots. We wanted to make a robot that's more like a tool that helps people do their work, more than this big machine behind a fence that deals with people's jobs. The team created what today is known as collaborative robots or cobots. In 2015, everything changed. Universal Robots was acquired for $285 million. It actually opened the eyes for the world at large. Everybody was start talking about the future is collaborative robots. Prior to UR, there was a lot of talk about all the things that never worked in Odense. And now people, they talk about all the things that are possible. So everybody suddenly realized there's something special going on in Odense. And this was only the beginning, because it wasn't just universal robots. There's a whole string of equally great companies in the making. Companies that are also growing at phenomenal rates of more than 50% a year. Ranging from startups to large corporations, Wounds are now houses dozens of robotics companies and a total of several thousand employees. I have not seen any denser cluster of robot technology anywhere else. We have the university with the world-class research. We have the technological institute, which brings technology out to the industries. And then we have the local government, who is all for robotics and all for robots. People see each other as colleagues more than competitors. Companies are building their own business on other companies also. And they need each other. So they exchange information, they even exchange people. We have some extremely exciting jobs here uh, that you cannot find in other cities. A limiting factor on high-tech industries is usually talent. And talent is attracted by talent. And the critical mass of talent is in Odense. There's a huge interest in investing in Odense now. And it's been a lot easier for the startups to, to raise funding. When you come out and say that you are part of the Odense robot cluster, you get an ear with the customers. But Odense needs more. It needs you. 
are already one of the leading cities in the world, but I think that once as a robotic city can grow even further. It's probably one of the best places in the world to start building robot businesses, and that's why Odense has become, let's say, a rising star in the robot scene in the world. If you are able to succeed in robotics, then it's here. Yeah, so hope you really enjoyed that video. Uh, at least to me, it's a huge surprise how big the, the the ecosystem has been able to grow. And same thing as you just heard Fady say, uh, even in Boston, they're like, hmm, that's interesting. So head on over to investinodense.dk. You, you'll get a good overview of the ecosystem there and you'll be able to keep, keep tabs on what's happening. Uh, there's also a newsletter you can sign up for so that you're in the loop. Hope you'll enjoy it, guys. Bye. This Tear down this wall. It's more than just an alliance. An alliance. This, this is a union of values, of values. United and determined, we can serve as a model for other regions of the world. The nature of a problem, problem requires a European response. Europe is a story of new beginnings, new, new beginnings. Let's start acting, acting, acting.